All right, welcome back this afternoon. Hello, everybody. I'm just coming to, I don't know, have an extra cast in the characters today. I'm, I'm joining the cast. It's my absolute pleasure. I wanted to be here this morning, but I couldn't because I got put into some university management meeting. Um, I'm Eloise Scotford. I'm the Dean of the Faculty. And the first thing I ever did as an academic in environmental law was write a dissertation on the law of waste. So this is um, a very special moment for our faculty to have this many people in a room talking about waste law, I think is a pretty special thing. Um, I wanted just to say a couple of things very quickly, apart from welcome. Um, and I know this is, I feel like this event is the product of a community that has grown from a number of people. Um, who are sitting in this room. The organisers, but Pierre, use your input. Um, conversations, I know, Catrian, Alison, um, who, you're the main organisers, but there's a kind of a team of you that I know have been working um, as a community, but that it's, it's the group that you formed, which has been wonderful and has been doing excellent work, but it's also conversations that have happened bit by bit over a number of years that have built into something a bit more formalized, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, and I say that with a very kind of, from a very selfish perspective of just for a long time, no one wanted to talk to me about the law of waste. So well done. Um, the moment has come. I think that community building is really what um, leads to uh, really robust knowledge development in a field. Um, and so that uh, is, is only a good thing. Um, waste law is really hard, which I'm sure you're all encountering. And it's hard because it's kind of a misnomer. And this has happened so much in environmental law that it's like a coherent field. Um, and I think you can get so far in thinking about concepts of waste before you start need to start splintering off into different sectors, into different industries, into different streams, which suddenly have quite diverse characters. And, and so there's a there's kind of multiple worlds within, within the world, the legal doctrine, the regulatory kind of aspects, the interdisciplinary aspects, the interaction with policy, all of this means that it's not very stable ground on which to be kind of doing research, but nonetheless, it's super, super important. Um, the other thing I noticed about today, which I, made me really, really happy, uh, and very impressed with all of you, particularly, and I give credit to the organisers here, was the um, incredibly generous approach to uh, sharing and discussing work that you have used. And I know that you kind of used that style of discussing in presenting each other's papers this morning, um, and also giving uh, their platform to those doing doctoral research. So there's kind of equal billing in the, in the agenda is really, really important. So kind of well done and wonderful stuff. And I'm just here to say, do good stuff. And I'm very excited. And I hope, I mean, what's the output going to be? Special issue book. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to read, read it. I mean, the, and the papers look really, really good. So I can't stay for that long, but I'm going to stay for a little while and sit and listen. But now I hand over to the very capable chair this session and I'm going to excuse myself and come and sit in the audience. Uh, thank you very much Eloise. This is it's amazing to have support of such a prominent figure um, of the Dean. You're right? Moving on <laughs> thank you so much again. Um, my name is Luca. I'm going to be chairing today's um, amazing session um, panel of uh, four PhD panelists um, and this is a really great opportunity to give a bit more prominence as already Eloise mentioned to waste law as a distinct field of study and this is basically on the background of a two-day workshop that we are having today here at UCL uh, which basically has the idea of um inspecting how to prevent the wasting of, of waste uh, this is a central topic currently um and it will grow in the future and this is the idea of um the waste law reading group uh, which is convening this uh, panel and it is trying to bring more prominence to the topic especially uh 
between early career researchers, um, PhD students, uh, as well as LLMs and uh, undergraduate student, students. Um, the, as uh, Eloise very well put, we are trying to build a community of waste lawyers um, that find passion in discarding and not discarding things. <laughs> um, so basically, if we just go to the point, um, first off, we'll be hearing from Garance Thomas. Uh, she's a PhD candidate at Science, Sciences Po Law School in Paris. Uh, the title of her talk will be uh, How to do things with Bruno Latour, a proposal for waste law. Uh, next will be Leonora Klepa Sterfeld. Uh, she is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Law, University of Copenhagen. Uh, and she will be talking about transnational environmental crime and the regulation of e-waste flows through a legal infrastructure, in, legal infrastructure lens. Uh, next will be Mikolaj Shafransky. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at LSC Law School here in London. Uh, and the, talk, the title of his talk is Twinned Legal Scripts of Planned Obsolescence. Uh, finally, we'll be hearing from uh, Manvi Kishore uh, online. Uh, she will present on behalf of Arnold Stanley and herself. Uh, they're both uh, fifth year law students at St. Jo Joseph's College of Law, Beng Bengalaru, India. And they will be talking about the need for liability regimes in least developed countries uh, and, the Basel Con and the implications of the Basel Convention. Uh, so if I just go right to the point and give Garance Thomas her word. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I think I must apologize uh, because I think what will follow perhaps may be boring for the members of the reading group and for the ones that are not part of it because uh, I will present uh, things that have already a bit been discussed in the reading group and that my work is a bit based on reading group um, uh, question we raised and so it's a bit uh, exclusive in that way but uh, we will try. So I will try on, uh, I will uh, um, start on the legal inquiry then um, um, follow on legal quality Qualification. I will um, show you how there is a legal conflict about waste law and property law, and I will uh, then um, show how this conflict illustrates a theory uh, of uh, Bruno Latour that helps us to think uh, law at the Anthropocene age. So uh, my contribution is based on three questions we ask ourselves during uh, the, our reading group session. The first question um, we delve into was the limit of the definition. Uh, we discuss a few objects uh, such as biocar or food waste, and we were like really, uh, um, um, we, we, found, we found hard to uh, really define uh, waste uh, compared to those objects. A second question came uh, through our discussion was um, uh, the um, implementation of torts among the supply chain of waste, either national chains or international chains. But the question was the effi efficiency of torts among the chain. And the third uh, point we raised was about limitation of production. At the beginning of our um, reading group, we raised the question of this effectiveness of the principle of uh, limitation of production enshrined in the European hierarchy of treatment as the first principle. Uh, we wonder how we can uh, find a translation to the obligation um, that lie down the IPCC report of stop producing and leave the fossil fuel inside the earth. And uh, the move I make um, among those questions is to um, 
uh, set the question on production and on property and not on torts. I think that through the history, um, in, if, if you take um, legal history, the question of, um, of waste and production lie before on property. If you take, for example, the waste doctrine law of Blackstone, which prohibited the extraction and destruction of lands and where, when then moved to torts, um, with, for example, the polluter prey principle. So during the early 19th century, the polluter right and polluter prey principle have been enshrined, transforming criminal prohibition on property into the distribution of a right in the field of civil liability. So there is a move uh, from property to torts. And what I want to point is that perhaps we should move back to property to uh, assure the, um, this uh, stop producing principle um, and implement it into the law. So um, the legal method I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to follow to question uh, first the inter, inter in, indeterminacy of the object and the thoughts implementation. I will start with the definition uh, and uh, I will start to uh, the, the legal category and the legal epistemology as a constitutive approach to law. Uh, when you think in terms of constitutive approach to law, uh, uh, law, um, sort fact into legal category and the legal category then um, um, uh, um, have a legal regime that shape the social reality itself. So my, on, my main question is what is the legal category of waste as we supposed to be indeterminate? What are the conditions to be defined as waste? So I go back to the basics and I'm focusing on the waste definition and not the regulation itself. And so when you look at the definition that is on um, the European directive is a waste is any substance or object with which the holder discard or intends or is required to discard. Here we see some elements rela related to objects, but they're escaping the property vocabulary because we have objects or substance, which is not property itself. And we have, uh, uh, so the, there is another grammar than the one of property. And as a closing notion, there is the question of obligation over material and objects that convoke the ontology of risk towards an object. So in the definition, we can see a conflict on on the ground of the objects, the right of ownership is supposed to be, is supposedly to be the only legal concept we have with objects. And it is not normally covering the abandonment phase because the owner sovereignty over something are set in the abandonment phase as Egel um, wrote the ownership disappears through the will of the owner. So the res de relicta imply a clear intention uh, and a clear control. But the waste definition uh, does not depend and waste does not depend on the will of the holder and the removal of material. National and European case law have extended the waste definition to cover certain property that has not been abandoned and uh, neither by intention, neither by physical abandonment. So waste, uh, waste can be more classified, classified as a result of an obligation over something than through property lens. And um, we could say that waste has no relation to property rights as if it were the con contemporary expression of Roman res de relicta, 
waste is acti actively created by property law in the sense that the wearing and the abandonment of things are both function of the owner's sovereignty over the object. But waste, however, is not defined by property right, by, but by an ad hoc regime conceived by European Union. So this will be my, um, my, my, uh, the thesis I want to express. Insofar, uh, civil law is interested in prior procession and European law, which was the first to define waste as an object, is concerned with the future risk posed by this material. So here we have a, a spatial temporal conflict, uh, according to uh, Mariana Valverde um, uh, uh, theory. And so my research question is on uh, how does property cannot encompass waste? And I will try to uh, argue that legal conflict streams from the incapacity of property to define waste. Um, and I will try to say that ownership cannot accommodate and define waste. Uh, it's based on intuition by uh, following uh, Marie Douglas theory of, on, on, of uh, dirt as a matter out of place. And she invites us not to see the margin itself and the marginal objects, but more the core of uh, the regulated process uh, created by, by this ma marginalization, which is property. So, um, I will um, I will try to explain how property uh, property rights incapacity to conceive waste, focusing on what property conceal. Um, as property law is not a suitable field for the qualification of waste, as property ties the object to the subject without acknowledging its materiality, its temporality, and its value. And I will also show how property rights inca is incapable of conceiving waste because of what is conceived of. And I will uh, try to explain through the property law grammar how, how waste cannot fit inside because property delves into control, ownership, and delve into the patrimonialization of things and not things that we. Uh, get rid of. Okay, so uh, I will uh, quickly go on uh, how what property conceal. I think it conceals the materiality. If you follow, for example, uh, Marx's uh, theory about objects, he warns us against a reflex uh, we have thinking about property as an object, but property is more a right than an object. It's a right that uh, binds two people over an object. So property right does not conceive material objects and its potential, potential degradation. But objects in law are not material objects. They are legal objects. And they are, they are classified facts into legal categories that distort their material basis. If you, for example, take uh, oil dumped in a soil uh, it's turned to be immovable, immovable good, good and not uh, uh, oil anymore. So um, this, this is the question of uh, materiality. And if you, Bruno Latour uh, is really engaged about how uh, law does not encompass materiality. Uh, property law does not encompass time neither. The principle of property is the perpetuity. And it's just the contract that receives the time that passed. And property law does not conceive value also. Value are more conceived through contract law than property itself. Um, so here is the concealment. And uh, what, how uh, property is uh, conceived and how is rejecting uh, waste, we can see that Property is an anthropocentric institution. If you look at Romanis describing the constitution of civil law category as they, is, they establish it as the patrimonialization, when you look at the digest, 
uh, it's really clear that, uh, for example, use naturalis and uh, the natural law was instituted only in the interest of mankind. And so there's full of example uh, in Roman law that say that uh, everything is uh, law institute nature only on the interest of men. Also, um, uh, um, property law is based on human control. For example, the Latin root of goods, uh, bona, is um, uh, means uh, make happy and uh, means fortune and means uh, things that uh, uh, be, uh, make people happy and and valued uh, and value things so everything is based for uh, accumulation and heritage much more than anything um and also, if you came through uh, the classification of uh, of, uh, of property, uh, you have uh, anything that is uh, really uh, related to uh, things without any value. Also, I want to go back on the abandonment um, abandonment figure uh, because um, abandonment was made on. Uh, the term occupatio is the acquisition of things that belong to no one is based on animus and corpus, which is the intention and the possession itself. Um, but actually, Roman law set up a really casuistic variation of this sort. And uh, through the casuistic, we can see that the Roman law uh, um, classify and value objects. Uh, also, the issue with the uh, property law is that the paradigmatic object of ownership is humans and lands and not objects. And uh, uh, property law was based more on lands uh, regulation that, um, that uh, yes, than uh, objects. And I just want to uh, highlight how this is uh, related to uh, and how could we see that? Uh, how could we see through the, lens, through the lens of Bruno Latour? Because here I want to explain that the legal epistemology cannot define waste, and waste has to be defined by the risk ontology and not the legal epistemology. And I think uh, Bruno Latour shows us that the summa divisio, which defined things and objects, were no more functional and they never been functional. And now the administration of things are not determined by law, but by other kind of uh, normative structure. And I think uh, what uh, this, uh, this application of Bruno Latour can be inspiring for other research on environmental ground. Thank you very much, Garance. This was amazing. Um, we're gonna uh, keep the Q and A's at the end. So save your questions. We're hopefully we're going to have a very nice discussion at the end uh, that also applies to everyone online. You can uh, put them in the chat and we're going to check them on afterward. Uh, so now let's go onwards. Um, Do you want to have this? Sure, uh, absolutely. Here we go. Okay. So that's me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Leonora Klippis-Starfeld, and I'm from the University of Copenhagen, Faculty of Law. And I want to start by thanking the co-conveners of this workshop, Dr. Alison Lindner and uh, Dr. Katrin Steinsman for engaging with this important topic and uh, for allowing me the opportunity to present uh, today and speak about my PhD research. So my presentation is titled uh, Transnational Environmental Crime and the Regulation of E-Waste Flows. And within this title, there are uh, several elements that need to be unpacked. And I want to start by speaking to the e-waste component. So e-waste refers to electronic or electrical equipment, also called EEE, that has reached its end of life, meaning it cannot be used for its original purposes anymore. 
And this covers a plethora of appliances, including household appliances, computers, phones, toys, but also things like solar panels and medical devices. It also includes the components such as batteries, circuit boards, cathode ray tubes, and lead capacitors. And e-waste is today called one of the fastest growing waste streams globally. And this does perhaps not seem surprising when we consider the extent and the amount of electronic equipment that we personally engage with in our day-to-day -day lives. It's also not surprising considering the fact that a lot of these electronic devices are manufactured in a way where planned obsolescence plays a significant role in terms of ensuring that consumers continue buying new products. In addition, many of the essential technologies for a green transition, such as electrical vehicles, obviously rely on various electronic components. So on the one hand, we have this vast and growing flow of e-waste and what is then the link to transnational environmental crime. Well, these e-waste flows that are chiefly originating in a region such as the EU or in countries like the US, Canada and Australia have historically and still do flow out of these countries and into developing countries. These flows can be termed illegal because there are various regulations that are placed on international, regional and domestic level that criminalize these flows under the heading of prohibition of transboundary movement of hazardous waste, or in case of domestic legislation, targets e-waste specifically. And what we know is that several illegal shipments of e-waste take place every day that do not live up to the requirements set out in these regulations. And I will return to some of the ways that this is being done later on in my presentation. The environmental aspect associated with this specific waste stream and which in turn provides the rationale for describing these flows as transnational environmental crime comes from the harm that materializes once e-waste reaches its destination and valuable raw materials like copper, aluminium, silver, gold or iron are extracted from the e-waste by picking the appliances apart. It is in this process the, that the environmental harm transpires, specifically when this process is performed with very little technology to minimize exposure to harmful emissions and with little or no protective equipment. These processes allow for the emission of dangerous chemicals into the air and it pollutes and contaminates water and soil bodies. The illegal movement of e-waste across boundaries is thus of significant concern for a plethora of reasons relating to environmental justice, sustainable development, legitimate economies, but also more broadly the rule of law. So how am I approaching the issue of transnational environmental crime in relation to e-waste? Well, first off, I'm taking Ghana as a local focal point for my PhD. Ghana has been chosen as a case study because the country has been and is still a hotspot for e-waste flows. In my first pro project, I will focus on the illegal waste flows from the EU towards Ghana and seek specifically to untangle the role that law plays in relation to these flows, specifically because accompanying e-waste flows is a complex set of regulations at various levels. On the one hand, there is a growing body of domestic, regional and international regulation that seek to halt illegal trade and dumping of e-waste or which touch upon this issue of electronic waste in other manners. And these laws are found across diverse regimes and cover areas that relate to, of course, environmental protection, but also things such as trade and human rights and workers' rights. At the same time, there is a lack of knowledge about how these regulatory frameworks interrelate, overlap, impact each other, and as such, organize or impact the movement and flow of this specific type of good. Overall, the literature remains underdeveloped in terms of exploring the role that law plays in relation to e-waste flows. 
So in my project, I want to combine doctrinal legal research and social legal research to address this gap. And doctrinal research will be used to provide a systematic exposition of the rules that relate to the movement and disposal of e-waste, as well as analyzing the relationship between the different rules at vertical level, so also horizontally between regimes. In addition, a socio-legal approach will be mobilized to look at how existing laws enable and constrain actors' behavior, and as such, the illicit and illegal movement of e-waste. Socio-legal analysis is an interdisciplinary uh, approach to analyze the law and its relationship to society, allowing engagement with not only what the law is, but also how the law operates and affects people who experience it. And while I'm still at the very start of my PhD, um, I've been lucky enough to have had the time to carry out some preliminary field work in Accra in Ghana. And during a one month stay in February this year, I was able to get in contact with several national actors, including the Environmental Protection Agency, the Energy Commission, Customs Agency, and the Ghana Ports and Harbor Authorities. In addition, I spend a lot of time getting into contact with scrap dealers and informal waste workers. And I want to share some of the preliminary findings with you today to give a look into the problems and the types of contestation that are visible at the local level in a receiving country of inflows of e-waste. And the very first thing I want to do is situate the discussion around e-waste in the local context. So inflows of e-waste into Ghana is in no way a new phenomenon. Back in 2008, uh, Greenpeace released a report titled Poisoning the Poor Electronic Waste in Ghana, which documented the extent of hazardous appliances reaching the ports that were being picked apart for valuable raw materials. And so the question becomes, where are we today? What has happened since? Well, two very major things have happened. Firstly, the scrapyard called Agubushi, which is located right in the city center of Accra and uh, was previously the hub for e-waste dismantling, not only in Ghana, but perhaps also in Africa as, as a whole, uh, has been demolished. This happened in 2021 after international pressure following the release of many news reports and many reports that documented the work taking place at the sites. The demolition in itself was a very, very violent event and for many surprising incidents. From one day to the next, the livelihood of thousands and thousands of scrap workers was completely destroyed. However, in spite of the demolition of Agbogushi, the inflows of e-waste have not stopped, nor does it mean that the harmful practices relating to extraction of raw materials from these appliances have ended. What we are seeing now is merely that the extraction is taking place elsewhere and has become much more fragmented. Chiefly, the scrap workers have moved into the informal settlement called Old Fadama, which is located right next to Agbogushi, meaning that they are performing these practices much closer to their own homes uh, than they were doing previously. Others have scattered around the city, and this fragmentation in itself makes it much harder to oversee and manage the situation. The other major thing that has uh, happened has been the introduction of various legislative instruments that target e-waste. Firstly, there are the regulations from the Energy Commission on secondhand fridges stemming all the way back to 2008, but an additional 17 have now been added in 2022 that uh, focus on other types of EE and seek to ensure that their energy efficiency is of an adequate standard if imported. This includes things such as computers, kettles, washing machines, microwaves, rice cookers, and televisions, meaning that you cannot import, for example, near end of life computers that have a poor energy efficiency. Secondly, in 2016, uh, Ghana passed the Hazardous and Electronic Waste Control and Management Act, which implements Ghana's obligations under the International Basel Convention. However, in spite of these legislative developments, we know that several illegal shipments of e-waste into Ghana continue to take place. 
And one of my aims while conducting my preliminary field work was to get a sense of how this was happening. And through the interviews I conducted, several methods uh, to bypass the regulatory framework emerged. One of the ways was that people would simply put the e-waste in the very back of containers. And this might seem intuitively too easy, but it is very efficient because when customs open these large containers that might be filled to the brim with uh, other uh, appliances, they do not have time to thoroughly inspect each and every item. And this relates very much to the other way, way of bypassing the legal framework, uh, which my respondents at the various uh, governmental agencies describe, namely the misdeclaration and mislabeling of what is in the containers. So the containers come in with, for example, a mix of secondhand electronics and e-waste, and this is then only termed secondhand electronics, which is not subject to the 2016 Act, for example and therefore bypasses that regulation. When combined with the method described earlier of putting the e-waste at the very back, even when the containers are inspected, it is very hard to detect. Misdeclarations and the issue of secondhand electronics should now be easier to, uh, to investigate due to the Energy Commission's regulations, as well as the implementation of um, newer scanning technology at the port. But even with this technology and this regulations, e-waste is still smuggled in. And this I was told by one respondent could happen with people operating at the port, photoshopping the scanned pictures, so that when it was sent to those who checked them, it would appear that a container was full of bicycles rather than freezers. I also spoke to a respondent from the Energy Commission who described a situation where someone had merely been labeling their containers as diplomatic cargo, meaning that customs were unable to physically inspect the containers because diplomatic cargo is subjected to a different set of uh, rules. And uh, it turned out that they were smuggling in secondhand fridges. And these are only some of the ways in which the regulatory frameworks are contested and through future field work, not only in Ghana, but also at the European ports. I want to further understand and explore these methods, but also more broadly understanding the role of law in impacting and facilitating these illicit flows. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing your questions. <laughs> and that is it. Um, yeah, it's me. Um, thank you very much, Lenora. Um, this was very nice, very interesting to hear the um, global south perspective on the transnational shipments of waste. Um, next one up is Mikolai. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Luca. All right. Just a wee uh, trigger warning at the outset, my talk will incorporate descriptions of suicide later on. I just wanted to flag this up in case any member of the audience might be distressed by that. Uh, so this is a snippet of a larger body of work related to my doctoral research, which is provisionally entitled International Law and Global Risk Governance, the Making and Discarding of Smartphones. In my thesis, as I hope to make apparent in the presentation, I operate with a term that is perhaps uh, peculiar to lawyers. Because what is, at the end of the day, the waste footprint of smartphones? Aren't smartphones just e-waste? So I contend that the story of waste and smartphones isn't limited just to the story of what the law says about the disposal of electronic waste. Electronic waste is not a given. It is a result of choices that are made in the production process. So beyond the domain of electronic waste, there are many other ways in which production of smartphones can be wasteful. Because how often do we think of the waste that's generated in the process of mining materials that individual components of the smartphones are made up of? What is it that we can say about the waste generated in the manufacturing process? So the term waste footprint is a nod and an acknowledgement of um, a nod to and an acknowledgement of the discard studies scholarship that seeks to defamiliarize 
uh, conventional portrayals of waste. And I operationalize it as an attempt to capture both the wastefulness of production and post-production end-of-life disposal. I also reject the framing of waste footprint of smartphones as a solely environmental problem. So instead, what I do is I follow the story of what happens uh, with various streams of waste generated as a result of production and use. Um, and I propose that international law operates with three distinct scripts of governance of waste. The first one being waste as a bad. So it's something to be regulated, something to be eventually eliminated. The second one would be waste is a good, uh, something to be commodified and resourcified. The third one would be that waste is neither a good nor a bad. It's rather a key input of production in a closed loop circular economy. So overall, I'm interested in unmasking what socio-scientific assumptions have contributed to each of these legal framings. And secondly, what distributive impacts have these regimes generated as a result of, of relying on these epistemic presuppositions? Now, my presentation today is based on a chapter of my dissertation that pertains to the third script, waste as a key input of production in a circular economy transition. There is something very prescient about the circular economy framing. And I believe that it's the understanding of waste as stretched to include considerations of upstream production. So that explains why some circular transition proposals are articulated under the banner of tackling planned obsolescence. Let's just quickly recap on how this notion of planned obsolescence relates to smartphones uh, by restating some very obvious facts. So in the last decade or so, uh, smartphone producers have started to sell us smart design solutions. Oh, let's not have the user worry about replacing the battery or fixing software on their own. No, let's make it easy for the user. Um, that became the conventional wisdom of the industry. And co consequently, upon the minor breakages or loss of one of the many functionalities, we are prompted to replace the smartphone rather than to repair it. So waste is something built in to modern smartphones. It's something that is designed in. And to some circular economy proponents, um, there is a firm connection between this critical, damning diagnosis and prescription. If waste is something designed, well, let's simply regulate design to make sure that some wastefulness can be eliminated at the outset. Uh, and this carves a particular role for eco-design laws. Uh, there is nothing new about regulating production or process methods and in doing that for environmental reasons. For example, the European Union has long had an eco-design directive, albeit its impact has been limited mostly to considerations of energy efficiency. Um, but the current Circular Economy Action Plan, so the EU's white paper, foresees uh, a recast of that directive. Now, the question is, are states really free to change the production and process methods of you know, how goods uh, um, are fabricated? PPM, production and process methods itself, is a term that we know from trade law. And all trade lawyers would have their alarm bells ringing because they know that PPM can be a non-tariff barrier to trade if it's done improperly. So how to do PPM for eco-design properly and prudently? Well, what has been acknowledged by commentators on the EU eco-design proposals and by the EU itself is that there is a need to harmonize the definitions of design solutions and material efficiency um, that would be used to draft this directive uh, and to design some, to devise some smart and specific regulations pursuant to this directive. That means that there is a special role to be played by international standardizing bodies. So in the paper that this presentation is based on, I zoom in on the institutional developments in three standardizing bodies, the uh, CENELEC, so the European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardization, um, the International Electrotechnical Commission, and the International Organization for Standardization. 
So to spare you the details, all three bodies have been working on circular economy and material efficiency standards for electrotechnical products. Um, and I would say, watch this space, but the fruit of the work, even, uh, which, even when it's going to be finalized, will not be public, it will help towards, uh, there is an assumption that it will help towards harmonizing material efficiency assessment and making it operational in the context of managing um, organizations and making interactions with them more efficient. So uh, finally, um, when talking about the life cycle of materials that are utilized in smartphones, we would have common benchmarks to carry out comparisons. And um, in the long term, it is expected that this will make smartphones more durable, that it will reduce the rate of generation of e-waste. I guess conjectural arguments can be made that it will result in smartphones you know, being more prone to modular design solutions, so suitable for user tinkering. Um, but I think that there is an unexamined side of all of this. Whereas the technical standard-centric eco-design framing of planned obsolescence promises a way of reducing the material intensity of smartphone production, it leaves behind, it leaves intact, the question of how production itself is organized. We are talking here about the very basics of organization of the factory floor, so the labor factor. This is uncanny, at least because circular economy is a broad register of progressive proposals for transformation and not one that can be reduced only to questions of, of governing materials. So this paves a way for critique of this particular way of delivering the circular transition, a way that is concerned with material and managerial efficiency, a way that is preoccupied with the flow of materials at the cost of overlooking social considerations. So let's examine the cross-section of the factory floor of, um, the, of the site that produces one, probably one of the most popular smartphones on the market today, Apple's iPhone. And the site is the Foxconn Longhua plant in Shenzhen in China. With the current demand for iPhones estimated at 220 million devices per year, working on the assumption that the plant operates 365 days a year, that means that 600,000 devices need to leave the factory every day. Now, how to meet such a demand? How to make production operable? Well, these questions have been examined thoroughly by sociologists of labor who've interviewed um, Foxconn employees. And the longer plant is kept running not only by exceptional discipline and drill abilities of, of managers, but primarily because it's a self-enclosed social system. There is a policy of merit and demerit points for mistakes. The entire perimeter of the factory is highly securitized. So you sleep, work, do your shopping up within the perimeter of the factory. You know that you shouldn't be taking this, any of this for granted because most likely you're working on a short-term contract. There is a likelihood that you are a freshly baked graduate of a vocational school and that your teacher who earned some extra money as a recruiter for Fox can recruit you there for an internship. What you receive at the end of the day is um, a meager 1.3% of the retail price of the assembled device, at least according to 2016 data. Now, to an entrepreneurial mind, no element of this description is hair-raising because this sounds on the surface like a classic social mobility through being a cog in the industrial machine story. But as the audience in the room will likely know, there was fallout from this factory setting. So in early 2010, reports of suicides in the Longua plant started to circulate in worldwide press. One suicide attempt survivor claimed that uh, after a month of being socially alienated and constantly reprimanded, she felt like she couldn't take it when she realized that the company mistakenly forgot to pay her remuneration. Uh, Foxconn, of course, reacted to these events. Um, 
as a risk mitigation measure. They installed safety nets to catch jumping survivors. Uh, and as a risk prevention measure, they committed themselves to a wage hike and made employees sign a non-suicide pledge. Perhaps it is fit to say that what we are looking at is the generation of human waste. We are still in the domain of garbology. We are still in the domain of studying discards. Zygmunt Bauman and Lloyd Vacon spoke long ago about the production of human waste. People who are deemed outcasts, delinquents, superfluous by the systemic design of the economy. To Bellman, the prerequisite for maintaining economic progress in the metropoly depended upon creating an excess and redirecting it elsewhere. Think about the monopolistic, uh, the mon mon monopolization of land ownership and improvements in tech, in agriculture in this country in the 19th century, and how it affected small scale farmers. So in short, collateral damage is endemic to progress. What could this mean for lawyers though? Well, perhaps there is a clear subsumption to be made. The choice to keep production as it is, is endemic to the progress on material efficiency that we're gonna make on eco by eco-design laws. For many years, events like this would be characterized in the legal and political sciences scholarship as evidence of a poor labor rights record. I propose to set this conventional framing aside and try to think of the about the organization of production with a distinct Fox labor regime as its epitome and as an instance of waste governance regime. So for that reason, in the last section of, of the paper, after which I base this presentation, I identify four characteristics of the just-in-time Foxconn uh, labor or waste governance regime a regime that has been internationalized and made operable to a different degree in Czechia and in Turkey. Uh, my argument is that when we talk of the waste footprint of smartphones, we should also be talking about the conditions that make the immiserating labor regime possible, i.e. state aid and business facilitative measures, the conditions for procuring labor, that is internal and external migration regulations, the labor administration measures, that is the level of oversight that is relevant to the particular type of work contract. And finally, the managerial efficiency standards that make lean management of the factory floor possible. So we make a full circle and we return to the question of technical standards. Wrap up the bifurcation of the discourse about regulating the green footprint of smartphones, that is the material footprint and the blood footprint of smartphones, that is the conditions of production. This bifurcation I consider as remaining an inconvenient truth that all proponents of change refuse to tackle. And it just happens to be so that in such a refusal, they happen to sanction the victim of none other by Terry Good, the CEO of Foxconn, who once said that high tech, is only something that happens inside the lab. Outside the lab, we talk only about the implementation of discipline. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, great to hear about uh, suggestions about broader approaches to, to um, production and to circular economy. Uh, now we will move to uh, online, to the virtual world, uh, where Manvi will present her um, her work that they do with Arnold Stanley. Good afternoon to one and all present here. My name is Manvi Kishore and I, on behalf of my co-author Arnold Stanley, will be presenting the paper titled the need for liability, liability regimes in least developed countries has the Basel Convention made an impact on the role of MNCs in transboundary shipment of hazardous waste. We are the fourth year students at St. Joseph's College of Law, Bangalore. I'll start by giving a brief introduction about the core theme of our paper. To start with the introduction, millions of tons of hazardous waste are moved across borders annually to find cheaper landfill 
disposal alternatives. Environmentally hazardous practices are more dangerous among the world's least developed countries. Government agreed to work together in an expeditious and more determined manner at the 1922 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro to create international law regarding liability and compensation for transnational environmental harm. The UNCED showed how complicated global environmental issues are because they affect so many different people and are caused by so many different things like agriculture, industry, biotechnology, waste generation and so many different environments like freshwater, oceans, forests, deserts, atmosphere. The UNCET Program of Action for Sustainable Development is also known as Agenda 21, recognizes that complex issues requires complex solution. A global convention, the Basel Convention on the Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Wastes and Their Disposal came into force on May 5, 1992. In response to the risk of environmentally unsound management of these wastes, the central argument of this article is that a successful hazardous waste regulatory regime must consider the unique characteristics of the hazardous waste trade, including the immaturity of the, of the states, of the regulation regime. The effect of raising the cost of legitimate waste disposal and the wearing attitudes of the states. First parties of the Basel Convention, including states, Intergovernmental organization and non-governmental organizations must agree on the forms of mismanagement to which it is susceptible, then it will be necessary to define the objective of a liability and compensation. We contend that enforcing adherence to the Basel Convention's rules and processes should be the top priority of any liability and compensation scheme. Furthermore, it is undesirable to compensate for all negative consequences, since doing so would widen the price gap between the legal and illegal trafficking and encourage the environmentally damaging method dealing with these wastes covert dumping. Further, we move on to the history and dimension of the problem. The Stockholm De Declaration on the Human Environment in 1972 was the first global sign of growing environmental awareness. Principle 21 of the Declaration of the Stockholm Declaration laid a weak conflicting foundation for the international actions. To make up for this, Principle 22 urged states to cooperate and develop further the international law regarding liability and compensation for the victims of pollution and other environmental damage caused by the actions and activities within the jurisdiction or control of such states to area without their jurisdiction. There were series of horrific events in 1970s and 1980s. It was necessary to regulate hazardous waste to the forefront of international agendas. It was after these horrific incidents. An explosion at the chemical plant near Seviso, Italy in 1976 blasted a toxic vapor into the skies. In spite of the extreme toxicity of the chemicals leaked, it took the plant manager seven days to alert local authorities and another five days for those authorities to take any further action. Further, certain heavily impacted regions were ordered, evacuated, and a comprehensive cleanup strategy was put into action. There were no immediate fatality, fatalities from the chemical leak, but there were over 500 incidents of skin irritation reported, and many animals were killed due to pollution. In 1984, in response of the Seveso incident, the Organization for Economic and Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, adopted a recommendation or decision that calls for countries to ensure that hazardous waste situated within their borders is managed responsibly, protecting both human and environment. In spite of being first several steps taken by international organizations, this idea did little to solve the issues of toxic wastes. 
In 1984, hazardous gas leaked overnight from a storage tank at a Union Carbide Chemical Manufacturing Factory in Bhopal, India. The incident uh, con it contaminated a 25 square mile area. The incident the poisonous gas killed over 1,600 people and injured over two lakh. Se several hundred more people died over the next months due to lingering effects of the gas. And the victims remained dying daily, even as late as 1987. After the Bhopal tragedy and several, uh, several others, other several magnitudes, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development issued a revised and expanded version of its recommendation. And the United Nations Environmental Program aided in the establishment of an International Environment Bureau in 1986. The primary goal was to regulate concern, knowledge, dissemination of these uh, initiatives. The impact of hazardous wastes on ecosystems in poor countries was a major source of worry. In response, that is dumping of toxic waste in poor countries. Poor countries used to allow the dumping of toxic waste uh, in, in lieu of money so that they, they, they get funds. So in response, the World Bank launched an initiative to assist low-income nations in implementing waste management regulations. Public became increasingly conscious of waste hazards. The Kian Sea, a ship from Philadelphia, attempted to bring 13,000 tons of incinerator ash to the Bahamas, but it was denied, but the entry was denied. The Haitian government demanded the ship to leave after 3,000 tons of fertilizer ash were dumped. The ship sailed, renamed itself, and sailed to the Far East and Middle East in quest of a suitable disposal location. This is just one of the example of many similar incidents as to how wealthy countries have repeatedly uh, used developing countries as a dumping ground of, for the waste, for the garbage. Developing nations view environmental uh, regulation as a wolf in sheep's clothing designed to perpetuate, perpetuate the existing cycle of poverty. Many people regard this as a coercive situation in which poor nations are being pressured by the promise of vast sums of money to make the short-sighted but ultimately disastrous decision to begin dumping their hazardous waste. Further, the Basel Convention, the solution or the tool with no implementation mechanism. The United Nations Environment Program sponsored the resolution known as the Cairo Guidelines in 1987 to help developing nations create safe hazardous waste disposal systems and address concerns about exporting garbage, garbage to other countries. The Basel Convention entered into force on May 6, 1992. According to Dr. Mustafa Tolba, the former executive director of uh, the UNEP, a major reduction in the generation of hazardous waste is the goal of Basel Convention. Convention's primary goal is to protect countries against the uncontrolled dumping of toxic wastes, substances or objects which are disposed of are intended to be or in, are intended to be disposed of or are required to be disposed of by the provisions of national law are all considered as trash under the Basel Convention expansive definition. The convention includes a detailed list of types of hazardous uh, waste. An exporting state must take guarantee of environmentally sound management of the trash and may only and may only export waste if it does not have the technical capacity and facilitates to dispose of the wastes in an environmentally sound manner, which is the central tenet of the convention. Party to the Basel Convention may not authorize the export or import of hazardous or other waste to or from a state that is not a member, not a party of the convention. The Basel Convention was established to regulate the export of trash for recycling or disposal. The five first you, you have five more minutes. All right. So for the uh, so basic uh, components of uh, an effective liability system. 
so here there are few pointers that I've mentioned that is fostering a system of embryonic regulation, finding loopholes in the regulatory system, uh, commercial activities, legal and illegal, uh, legal and illegal trade, uh, recognizing the value of trade and bilateral arrangements. Further, I want to explain liability regimes for the future. To start with the prevailing conventional uh, prevailing conventional regimes and not binding law that are soft law regimes. So to uh, start with the prevailing convention uh, regimes, the creation of a liability regime for uh, transboundary pollution uh, can utilize existing mechanisms such as transnational litigation or intergovernmental negotiation or litigation. The basic convention provides a a uh, framework for liability and compliance disputes, but lacks a compulsory uh, jurisdiction of arrangement. The second point is non-binding uh, law or soft law regime. That is, a soft law approach to liability would involve a non-binding multilateral declaration or set of rules. The purpose of this approach would be to address obstacles in uh, securing and enforcing local judgments in transmitted or intergovernmental litigation. However, the non-binding uh, nature of such instruments can limit their effectiveness and may not lead to significant changes in policy or actions. The third point is international or multinational process-based regime, so which is basically a legally enforceable instrument such as an addition to the Basel Convention could establish a process-oriented protocol to address jurisdiction and procedural issues in transboundary hazardous waste cases. Uh, the fourth point is bilateral or agreement-based regime. So in this, an international environmental liability regime involves a negotiated private law framework that establishes liability standards for transboundary hazardous waste movements. The liability regime can assign liability primarily to the entry holding hazardous waste at the time of discharge with secondary liability imposed on the waste creator. The fifth point is transnational or transcontinental continental finance regime. So basically, it is the implementation of private law system through negotiation for transnational uh, litigation, which would involve private litigants and national courts with the potential addition of international bodies, such as the Basel Secretariat, could provide information to potential uh, plaintiffs. In conclusion, in uh, conclusion and the way forward, I would like to uh, state more than 170 multilateral environmental accords have been established worldwide. Ways in which international lawyers and policymakers can increase the effectiveness of international environmental agreements are increased monitoring and verification, more systematic funding, better use of international institutions, and the establishment of supplementary regime, such as those relating to liability and compensation, are a few examples of how uh, it can be uh, the policymakers and lawyers uh, can increase the effectiveness of international environmental agreements. Uh, the next is uh, new regulations lim limiting the export and import of potentially dangerous substances are being evaluated. The United Nations Environment Program, that is the UNEP and the Basel Convention have established an effective system of re regulation. In addition to UNEP's lack of actual enforcement capabilities means that developing countries or other states may be left without a remedy if a state refuses to accept responsibilities for the actions of multinational corporations that are the MNCs. Uh, here I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for the consensus. Uh, thank you very much for the conveners and esteemed faculty for give us, uh, giving us the opportunity to present our papers. Thank you, Mark. So now it's uh, we're at the time um, for the most intriguing part um, for questions and answers. Uh, it's now it's on you to uh, interrogate the panelists. Um, are there any questions? Okay, um, just in front here, yeah. Uh, please could you just state to whom you're asking the question and then ask it. Uh, this is working? Yeah. This is for the talk on e-waste flow to developing countries. In particular for Ghana, has there been actual any progress in reducing the amount of e-waste flow into the country? 
to actually just yeah, yeah. Sure. Right. yeah um so the last time they tried to uh, document how much e-waste was coming in was in 2009 and they are currently right now trying to find uh, for 2023 how much e-waste is coming in but between that there has not been any documentation or reporting of it nationally so the answer is we do not know thank you okay uh, over here yeah yeah in here in front would you say, oh, that's bad. Would you say that, um, this again, to, about the developing countries, that more developed countries, so for example, the UK or the US, they also play a big role in this illegal shipment of waste to these countries and that the, the government have a more sort of sketchy role in this than you would originally think? Uh, that there is a role for the UK and other countries in Europe. For sure, they have, Interpol has had um, several um what do you call it operations where they've uh, targeted different ports in uh, in europe and italy and um, well in netherlands and i believe also the uk where they've tried to actually have a extended period of time where they thoroughly check the containers leaving the ports and when they do that they find out that yes there is a lot of mislabeling misdeclaration and things being hidden in the containers that is e-waste and that isn't being declared and um, so we know that it is leaving the ports uh, we also know that a lot of European countries are not interested in um, spending a lot of money on um, investigating exports we are more interested in what's coming into Europe of course what is crossing our boundaries um, and therefore yes governments do have a responsibility to also place money on what is leaving the ports. Oh uh, yeah, over there. Very cool. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentations. My question is to Manvi, but also everyone in the panel. Um, you were spoken very well about the e-waste from the mobile phones and other devices. My years, my years of research for the last 10 years shows that there's a much more, much bigger astronomical disaster than the mobile phones, which I've been talking about for 10 years, which is this transition that we all want to make, well, not everyone wants to make to Green New Deal, which is renewables. And everyone's so ensconed into wind turbines, solar panels, and electric cars, which are also tech-based because they all require the same minerals and same devices and they're all gonna be smart and they're all gonna be connected on wireless networks for your smart houses and everything's smart. But the problem is that whatever Manvi described and anyone else here described for the smartphones, just think of the size of the solar panels and the wind turbines, but thousands times bigger. And when people have told me to electrify the whole of India, just for electric cars, you're gonna to have to you're going to have to basically strip mine and remove every single blade of grass just to get the lithium. And this is India. I don't know about Africa. So my question is, is the mobile phones is just a scratch on the surface as we progress to save the planet and go more for renewables and more for all these devices. Then how are we going to deal with that? My only solution is that we need to stop these renewables because they are the biggest scam on the global south. And it's also coming to mines in the UK. Literally now I know mining companies doing sustainable local mining in the UK and North America. So my question is to everyone, um, how are we going to deal with this much, much bigger disaster on this path to being green? But actually, when we get to the end of it, we're going to realize we're living surrounded by wastelands in the UK, Canada, the US, everywhere. But thank you for your talk. And also one last thing I'd like to say, I'd really like to commend you guys because this is probably the first conference seminar I've been to where you guys have made an effort to engage with someone from the Global South on a Zoom. Thank you. Um, Manvi, will you take it over? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I am sorry, but my topic is not related to e-wastes. 
Uh, but anyways, as uh, he asked, as the question was asked, I would like to answer that clearly uh, mobile phones are not the only solution like if we, we you stop using it. Uh, but my topic, uh, basic uh, argument about my paper uh, was about uh, hazardous waste in uh, least developed countries. So uh, e-waste was not a part of my, uh, my arguments, my paper. So, sorry, correction, sorry. The e-waste is... Sorry, Myra. The waste I'm seeing all the way in states from Jharkhand to all the forests across India is basically putting the waste for mobile phones into the shade. And I'm hearing this from my friends in India, in Africa, all across the global south. So, yeah, you are correct in terms of the waste for the mobile phones, but I think we also need to look, look at the waste, which is not just the mobile phones, but all these electric smart devices as well, which is much, much bigger. Thank you. Do you have any response on that, Manvi? Or anyone else from the panel? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, well, the project that I'm part of, uh, which is called ELECO, where we're looking at minerals throughout its life cycle. So from the extraction part to the smuggling out of the countries where it is usually extracted, put into various electronic devices, mobile phones, yes, but also all of the things that we're gonna need for a green transition. And then the eventual dumping of the electronic devices in the same places where the original extraction took place. And uh, what we're seeing is of course that, for example, with some of the uh, solar panels that started being built 30 years ago, they are now becoming obsolete. And this is just the start of it that is gonna continue growing and we're gonna need more minerals we're going to keep extracting it. And all of these issues are going to be coming more and more pertinent. And there are many ways that we need to tackle it. One of them is in terms of mining, which uh, when people talk about green mining or sustainable mining, it's an mm -hmm. oxymoron. And um, so we need to figure out, first of all, better ways of mining. It's never going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be green better ways of mining we need to target the illegal flows of hazardous waste figure out places where we can sustainably or more sustainably um, manage this waste and get extract the metals and minerals from the existing waste instead of digging into the ground and so at all ends of this cycle we need to start targeting it and that's the only way forward yeah Okay. I just have a follow up just to say it won't alleviate all of your Sorry. It won't alleviate all of your concerns, but um, Colin Mackey and Anne Valenter are working on decommissioning obligations for uh, renewables. So there is work being done, but obviously that's at the end of the chain and it doesn't address the issues. But their, their work's really cool. Have a look at it. Hello, uh, thanks for a great presentation by the panel. Really excellent to see. I've got a couple of questions for Leonora and one for Mikolai. Um, so firstly, it was about decision-making process to demolish the scrap, um, in, informal scrap center in, in, in uh, Accra, mm. uh, because like you said, it was very violent. It, it led to really, <laughs> an outcome that probably makes it less manageable to have any kind of oversight and governance. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, because you did say that you'd had some engagement with uh, your regulatory authorities in Accra when you were there, yeah. whether you, you raised this as a, as a question, uh, because it does seem like what, why that decision was taken. I'd be interested in that from. Another one is, are you looking at the flows of money uh, in terms of, uh, you know, you've got the flows of materials, but it's the flows of money as well, because that obviously shapes um, power structures. And I'm just interested in that. And finally, <laughs> it's a bit cheeky, but um, you, you present your three kind of lines of inquiry and you, you chose to focus on the circular economy paradigm. And I just wondered if you see the circular economy space as one in which um, you can address the issues that your 
you focus on, particularly around the injustices around labor and you know the practice of the framing that you have of that of the waste of of, of human uh -huh. you know uh, so does the circular economy offer us a sort of space in which regulatory interventions can be made that's better than what we've got already yeah um okay so the first question about the uh, demolition um, when we spoke to uh, officials or when we speak to officials you don't talk about demolition you talk about replacing the people who work there you do but if you say demolition they say what what do you mean um, and so and the the impetus for it as i mentioned came from international pressure because ghana was being put in a very bad light it didn't look good internationally in their role as a west african country that is doing very well economically that this it didn't fit the picture um, and so when we come as European researchers asking about that, they don't want to continue that story. And so you don't talk about demolition. Um, and then secondly, in terms of the money flows, we have also as part of our project, we have an economist who will be trying to look at or dig into and explore the illicit flows of money, because we know with all illicit flows or illegal flows, they have a tendency to overlap and you kind of have to try to, to trace them together. So illegal flows of goods and money and people, you can kind of trace them together. And so that is definitely gonna be a very, very interesting thing to look at also because all of this raw material that is being extracted from the e-waste is obviously also being sold to someone and it's usually being sold outside of Ghana. So where is it going? Who's buying it? Where is the money coming in in that way? Um, thank you, Faya, for the question. Um, I, I think the flip side to this would be to ask if we can uh, think of, if we can devise a circular flow of goods, materials, money, and labor that, uh, you know, make our uh, smart food production possible. And I can't help but wonder whether in constructing such a query, okay, can we devise a circular flow of materials? We are already sanitizing uh, a certain way of doing business, a certain way of, of, of organizing production that is inherently going to be uh, extracted, that is inherently going to be generative of human waste. To drift slightly to the territory of the uh, question of your predecessor, so in regards of whether perhaps we are um, not paying attention to the most salient issues, to the toll of the, of the green transition. I think um, what we're looking at essentially is uh, circular extractivism, uh, a sense uh, that is a development in which, through which um, we still think of uh, devising a flow of materials that is okay now we need to securitize the supply of lithium because without lithium we won't be able to store energy for all these electronic devices for cars etc uh, we won't be able to um, power up power up many many other things um whereas in um and what we what we what we lose out as a result is um um Again, um, a, a, a serious neglect of considerations of demand, okay? We tolerate demand as a result of that, okay? As long as we can manage to organize a, a supply chain of, for example, lithium or some other key transition mineral, uh, we can continue with uh, the current level of, 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 of consumption. We can continue with the current level of demand. So, you know, as long... Um, my bottom line is, uh, uh, as a lawyer, I am in the, I work in the discipline of source criticism, and I, I'm not really seeing the power, the normative power of, of circular economy being used to really articulate proposals for okay, shrinking the cycles and, 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 thinking of, and thinking of the growth. Hence, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical. Any more questions? Well, if there are 
Any other questions? Want to first give them the opportunity? Yeah. No. Okay. You can go ahead. I've asked this question to a lot of lawyers in the last five years, and it's strange how I'm always kicked out of these conferences where I've asked them if in a few years' time, or even now, someone like myself or someone from India or Africa comes to the UK, trains in one of the universities, and actually says, um, which one of you environmental lawyers is going to help me litigate against yourselves? for litigating against the oil companies while actually desecrating my indigenous forests, like what's happening to my friends in Congo and Ghana and Nigeria and India, because you followed this mantra, which was saying this is green. There doesn't seem to have been any caution presided over these solutions. And at the same time, the people who hold most of the resources are Africans or Indians. Surely those people should be engaged in the conversation saying, we need these resources, but you're going to have to clear off your forest and you're going to have to piss off somewhere else. Would we contend with that imposition on ourselves if someone was to say, you've got to get out of Hyde Park, you've got to clear out Nottingham Forest, and you've got to live in the shack somewhere on the sidelines? Would we contend with that imposition if it was reversed from the Global South on us? But the pressing issue is, that this is an issue that my friends in Africa and India are telling me that's happening right now. When are people going to pay attention to that? Just because it's not spoken about here, it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's happening for 6 billion people. And we have to deal with this now, or if you want the resources, then you deal with the migration that happens from those countries and they come here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Or I uh, would. Yeah, I'm happy to answer. Are you going to start? Go ahead. Unless someone else is going to uh, When are people uh, going to start paying attention? Um, if you're talking about lawyers and you know the the students that that we educate as as teachers in this country, with the current design of the curriculum, I don't think we can we can foresee a change on the horizon. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm going to be very frank. First. The issue, so the format uh, of, 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 the, of the issue seems to be one about access to justice, right? Uh, but what if we start to theorize this through another angle, access to injustice? And what if we start to imagine ourselves as, as you know, scientists and uh, researchers and teachers, um, not as people who, you know, might eventually be able to mold those very noble lawyers who will go and work with uh, communities in the global south, who will pierce through the corporate veils, who will allow um, and those affected communities, whatever that notion implies, to, uh, to, to target the, uh, the parent company, which happens to be headquartered in the UK or in the state of New York. Um, no, let's, let's, let's reason otherwise. Let's imagine ourselves as teachers especially, uh, um, you know, this is something particularly relevant when you're based at a London-based institution. Let's try to imagine ourselves as teachers of people who will enter the field of lawyering, who will enter the legal profession, not necessarily to litigate on the side of those parent companies, but uh, in order to do due diligence for them, in order to do compliance checks for them. Uh, the, the, this, do you see where I'm getting with this? There is, no, so, there is much, so the legal script that allows these parent companies, that, ex, that allows the extractivist uh, industry to operate as it operates, to leave behind this massive footprint of, of waste, is also condition, is also rest on uh, the weaponization of legal expertise, uh, of risk management plans, of compliance plans, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, you know, is ultimately created by people who uh, achieve legal competence in, 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 uh, in law schools in the UK. So it's, it's not the case that uh, the, I don't, I, I'm just very skeptical as to thinking of finding resolutions to, to, to these issues through court, through litigation. Perhaps let's look at how the, all of the, all of the, the horrible um, episodes and histories that every single one of us can account for 
are generated through legal expertise that we sort of rubber stamp us as teachers. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Mikolai. Um, I think it's time to get back to the strict topic of our panelists. And I hear, I would really like to ask um, Garons, um, how are you, um, how did you come to this discussion about ways definitions that you're dealing with in, in your work? Um, okay, uh, I perhaps I'm gonna answer a bit of, about your question. Uh, sure, 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 go ahead. <laughs> about how uh, perhaps the fact that we don't see and this is invisible, it's how environmental law frame the thing. We frame the thing as with a, a tools such as compliance standards and things like that. It frames the thing as liability inside supply chain. And it doesn't frame the thing as property of means of production, right? You said you said that in the in the south they have the forest, they have the goods, right? But environmental law doesn't see that. You just see liability among chain to extract, but it doesn't see property. No, all it says starting with level south, we need to divest from fossil fuels. We want renewables, but those renewables need fossil fuels to get renewables, right? This is the problem. Mm -hmm. Very few people are listening to the global south. They want the resources for the global north, but then they're trashing the global south. And this is evident from hundreds of Africans and news will tell you we are never heard. Mm -hmm. But chickens will come home to roost in the next few years. But, uh, okay. Um, so I came to uh, the definition of uh, waste because I think as a lot of environmental tall objects, uh, law uh, is failing to define uh, objects and the thing, and uh, uh, the legal epistemology is failing to define things because our um, Summa divisio based on subject and objects and how objects are related to subjects fail to define uh, ways that are not uh, completely linked to subject and are no more linked to subject. And I think it's a uh, waste to reveal the anthropological um, um, frame of law that is no more uh, valid now, and that we should uh, really reshape uh, the way we saw law. And I think also that among uh, international uh, law, things are really, uh, we, we, we try to un implement compliance and standards and all of those uh, tools that are not legal anymore. As such, they are just translation from other like sphere such as technical sphere or moral sphere or ethical sphere. And I don't see how uh, there is law inside and how don't see how law can be efficient. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, just another question that I had on this topic. Are there any? Yeah, OK, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, it's actually a question maybe to expand on on what you've just been saying, because I don't think uh, in your presentation you got to go in so deeply into what Bruno Latour brings to the way in which we look at waste law. And I, I, I'd like to, to you to expand on that because I've come across his work in different contexts uh, and I'd like to sort of hear where you're going with sort of Latorian, mm. if that's how it's said. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I didn't have the time. I'm sorry. Um, um, in my presentation, I try to uh, first start with the objects to highlight his theory. So I think it's better to go that way than to the theory to highlight the object. Um, there is a main contribution of Bruno Latour in uh, "We Have Never Been Modern." And in his book, he starts to take a newspaper. He is taking a newspaper and he's just listed all the topics that were like found on the newspaper. And usually it go from like international affairs, national affairs, scientific affairs, all those like uh, criteria. Usually uh, newspaper I, are based like that. And he say that actually all those topics like 
uh, were sorted by criteria, but all the um, paragraph, a paragraph sorted in, in international affairs, interrogate scientific affairs, interrogate political affairs, inter interrogate local affairs, and stuff like this. So his main theory is about to say how we sort how how law and how we used to sort things is no more valuable now because how we uh, understanding what, how we uh, 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 law is based on this subject object division and objects are defined through the subject. And we say that objects, there is no more this object subject, this na nature culture, there is more hybridity beyond those uh, categories. And I think, um, I really think that waste as such express this hybridity because waste in, is not only perceived through humans possession, it's based on risk also and risk escape to all the um, subjective criteria are, um, and um, and so he, 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 he speak a lot about uh, hybrid objects and I think waste are a typical uh, hybrid objects il illustration and um, I try to express on uh, my presentation that property law was sketch as uh, related to humans in the human interests and uh, waste is the tip like the limited cases the typical limited cases uh, where the object is not linked to humans and how do we do with that thank you very much um I, I, I will use this opportunity to wrap up uh, our questions mm -hmm. and answers and uh, we'll move to um, uh, con concluding remarks by Al Dr. Alison Lindner. And so basically, she's the brains behind all this operation of the um, Waste Law Reading Group. Uh, so, yes, Alison. Um. Thank you, Luca. Um, I'm mainly going to thank people right now. So, first of all, I want to thank the audience, both in person and online, for your attendance and your engagement with the work of the panelists in the Waste Law Reading Group. I want to thank Emma, but I don't think she's here right now. Maybe she's hearing me somewhere. Um, Emma's our events manager, uh, um, one of the events managers in the faculty events team. And without her, this would not happen because <laughs> um, she's organized so much for us. Um, I want to thank Ellie Scottford, um, who's our dean, who's also uh, skipped out um, for a little bit, um, for supporting the work of the Waste Law Reading Group over the past two years. Um, and of course, I want to thank the panelists as well. Um, Dals, um, Nikolai, Leonora, and Manvi online. Thank you so much for joining um, from India. Um, you've all been great sports and you've all delivered really enriching presentations about various aspects of waste law. And clearly it has generated a lot of um, discussion and I'm sure we can continue that um, later on um, and as, you know, as time goes on. Um, and then I wanna thank Katrin, who is my co-organizer of this event. Um, so Katrin is based at the Faculty of Law at the University of Copenhagen, Dr. Katrin Steenemans, um, and she's previously a lecturer in the UK. Um, however, a couple of years ago, she left the UK for Denmark, um, which meant that, you know, we can organize this, um, this project together because it is a, it's a global engagement project. So it requires somebody based here, somebody based overseas to work together. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of work to put this together, you know, funding applications, logistical organization, um, we're putting together special issues, so that's also taking um, up a lot of time and a lot of effort, um, and so for that, I'm really grateful. Thank you, Katrin. And finally, I'd like to thank the chair of this panel, um, Dr. Lucas Schubel, um, who has caref very carefully kept us the time this evening, which is great. <laughs> Um, I think it's, and now I finished two minutes early. Um, yeah, we can all go upstairs for drinks for those of us who are in person. Um, I'm sorry, guys online, but you can't join us, but um, we will have a drink on your behalf if that's okay. Thank you. <laughs>